Imagine that it is Friday, September 8, 1922. You're at the Cedar Point, Ohio, USA, attending the historic nine-day convention of the International Bible Students. The air is charged with excitement. The principal speaker is addressing the audience on the subject, the kingdom. After offering clear scriptural evidence to show that God's kingdom is a reality, Having been established in the heavens in 1914, the speaker asked the audience, Do you believe that the King of Glory has begun his reign? Then comes the rousing call to action. Therefore, advertise, advertise, advertise the King and his kingdom. Now just think, if you had really been there, how would you have responded to that clarion call to have a share in kingdom proclamation? Of course, this question is hypothetical, yet it deserves careful thought and self-examination. You might ask, would that talk and call to action have fired me with zeal? The forward movement of Jehovah's organization since 1922 gives ample proof that thousands of faithful anointed ones who heard the call on that momentous occasion were indeed fired with zeal and exemplary zeal that we do well to imitate today. But what is zeal? The Greek word translated zeal literally means to boil. Other original language words have to, having to do with zeal carry the thought of otter, jealousy, toleration of no rivalry, and insistence on exclusive devotion. Therefore, a godly zeal means being eager, having a burning interest in doing what is right in God's eyes. To be sure, the finest example of godly zeal is that of our Lord Jesus Christ. Note how Jesus' godly zeal is evident in the account recorded in John chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. There we read, Now the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those selling cattle and sheep and doves and the money brokers in their seats. So after making a whip of ropes, he drove all those with the sheep and cattle out of the temple. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he said to those selling the doves, Take these things away from here. Stop making the house of my father a house of merchandise. His disciples called to mind that it is written, The zeal for your house will eat me up. Jesus never lost his zeal. He displayed it right down to the end of his earthly life. Why, it was godly zeal that moved him to cleanse the temple a second time. He did so on Nice and 10, 33 CE, just a few days before his sacrificial death. Imagine that dramatic temple cleansing. Mark chapter 11, verses 15 through 17 tells us, Now they came to Jerusalem. There Jesus entered into the temple and started to throw out those selling and buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. And he would not let anyone carry a utensil through the temple, but he kept teaching and saying, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a cave of robbers. What burning zeal God's courageous son displayed. In all of his dealings, and in all of his ways, Jesus manifested godly zeal and reflected the personal qualities and attributes of his heavenly father, Jehovah. In fact, Jesus imitated the father so perfectly that when he was asked to show the father to his apostles, Jesus could say, He that has seen me has seen the Father also. One of Jehovah's qualities that Jesus reflected perfectly is unflagging zeal. 
Jehovah has always exhibited great zeal for carrying out his declared purpose. For example, concerning the promise Jehovah made to bring about abundant peace through the princely rule of Jesus Christ, Isaiah assures us that the very zeal of Jehovah of armies will do this. And when promising that he will remove all opposition to that princely rule, Jehovah declared that by the fire of his zeal, he will gather and devour nations and, and kingdoms that stand in opposition. Like his father, Jesus loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. For that reason, Jehovah commissioned him to be chief agent and perfecter of our faith. You can read about that in Hebrews 1, 9 and 12, 2. With implicit trust in Jehovah and full confidence in God's promises, Jesus loyally fulfilled every aspect of his commission. Even when he was under the strain of humiliating torture, and knowing that he was about to suffer a shameful and painful death, Jesus zealously gave a fine witness for God's kingdom before the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. What an outstanding example for all of us to imitate. The disciples were eyewitnesses of the all-consuming zeal that Jesus manifested for Jehovah and for his servants. Many times they saw Jesus unselfishly ministering to the crowds, even though he was tired and hungry. At the end of a strenuous preaching tour, Jesus and his apostles felt the need to retreat to a lonely place in order to rest up a bit. But when they reached that place, they found that the crowds were already there wanting to be taught. What did Jesus do? He set aside his personal needs and started to teach them many things. On that particular occasion, he not only cared for their spiritual needs, but also provided food miraculously to satisfy their physical needs. Then, there's the account in the fourth chapter of John, this is of special interest because it helps us to understand why Jesus was always fired with zeal for Jehovah. Let us turn to John chapter 4 and read a portion of the account. Jesus and his disciples were on a journey from Judea to Galilee. They stopped outside a Samaritan city named Sychar for a little rest and refreshment. Beginning with verse 6 of chapter 4, we read, Now Jesus, tired out from the journey, was sitting at the fountain just as he was. The hour was about the sixth. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. Jesus seized the opportunity to initiate a conversation that eventually led to many Samaritans recognizing him as the Messiah. The disciples knew that Jesus was tired and hungry. So they left him at the well to rest while they went into the city to buy some food. Soon they returned with the food. And the account tells us in verse 31, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. As the disciples were reasoning among themselves regarding that perplexing statement, Jesus added, according to verse 34, My food is for me to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Yes, on that occasion, Jesus was sustained and fired with zeal by focusing on the fulfilling of his commission, which was stated in the opening verses of Isaiah chapter 61. Jesus had read that commission and had applied it to himself while standing in the synagogue in his hometown Nazareth. 
During the three and a half years of his public ministry, he tirelessly traveled on foot up and down the land of Palestine with his disciples, preaching and teaching the good news of God's kingdom, carrying out his stated commission. Turn now, please, to John chapter 5. Here we read about Jesus' complete reliance on Jehovah and his loyal adherence to divine direction. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 19. The Son cannot do a single thing of his own initiative, but only what he beholds the Father doing. For whatever things that one does, these things the Son also does in like manner. Jesus re-emphasized his reliance on Jehovah in verse 30. I cannot do a single thing of my own initiative. Just as I hear, I judge. And the judgment that I render is righteous because I seek not my own will, but the will of him that sent me. What do we learn from these words? We learn that Jesus was motivated by his deep love and affection for Jehovah. He always kept his earthly ministry or earthly commission foremost in his life. To that end, he taught, trained, and equipped his faithful disciples to continue the ministry that he had initiated. He told his disciples that their ministry would be greater than his. In what way? Well, their work would not be restricted to just three and a half years nor would it be confined to the area of a small Middle, Middle Eastern land. The commission Jesus gave them, recorded at Matthew 28, 19, and 20, and Acts 1, 8, makes this very clear. Let us turn in our Bibles to those texts and reflect on what is stated there. First, look at Matthew 28, 19, and 20. The resurrected Jesus had arranged to meet his disciples on a mountain in Galilee. When they gathered there, uh, Jesus explained, as stated in verse 18, that Jehovah had granted him all authority in heaven and on earth. On that basis, uh, Jesus gave the command and commission that we read in verses 19 and 20. He said, Go therefore, and make disciples of people of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you. And then, as an expression of reassurance and encouragement, he added, and look, I'm with you all the days until the conclusion of the system of things. Now, let's consider Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. We find Jesus' words to his disciples just before his ascension to heaven. He told them, You will be witnesses of me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the most distant part of the earth. The disciples could easily relate that assignment to Jesus' prophecy recorded in Matthew 24, 14, namely, This good news of the kingdom will be preached in all the inhabited earth for a witness to all the nations. How did the apostles and other disciples respond? Did they recognize the commission as legitimate? Were they fired with zeal to follow through? The inspired record of their activity during the remainder of that century testifies to their immediate and zealous response and to Jehovah's rich blessing upon them. What they accomplished as recorded in the book of Acts of Apostles, proved beyond question that they were fired with zeal. Please turn again to that book in your Bibles. Chapter 2 shows that on the day of Pentecost, Holy Spirit was poured out on the small group of faithful disciples assembled together in Jerusalem, just as Jesus had promised. Soon, crowds of curious Jews and proselytes came to investigate. Some began to ridicule. 
But Peter convincingly demonstrated from the scriptures that Jesus, whom they had impaled, was indeed the Christ, and that God had resurrected him. When sincere ones among the crowds heard this, they, they felt stabbed to the heart. Verse 37 reports that they turned to Peter and the rest of the apostles and begged, Men, brothers, what shall we do? Peter gave the needed counsel, and then, as verse 41 shows, those who embraced his word heartily were baptized, and on that day, about 3,000 souls were added. The subsequent account relates that all of these were fired with zeal, and Jehovah continued to join to them daily those being saved. In chapters 3 through 6, the book of Acts further testifies to the unflagging zeal of those early disciples of Jesus Christ. Undaunted, they continued in their ministry, even when brutal persecution came upon them. Their steadfast attitude is evident in their prayer, recorded in verses 24 through 30 of chapter 4. They addressed Jehovah as Sovereign Lord and expressed confidence that he was in full control in spite of the wicked deeds of the enemies. The disciples concluded their prayer with a heartfelt petition recorded in verse 29. And now, Jehovah, give attention to their threats and grant your slaves to keep speaking your word with all boldness. What exemplary zeal they manifested, and that prayer was answered, for God empowered them to preach his word boldly. The rest of the book of Acts, we read about the zealous ministry and missionary service of many others, both men and women, young and old. It is obvious that they were fired with zeal, and Jehovah richly blessed their ministry. In the seventh decade of the first century, the Apostle Paul reported in his canonical letter to the congregation in Colossae that the good news was already bearing fruit and increasing in all the world. He encouraged the Colossians to remain steadfast and not be shifted away from the good news which was preached in all creation that is under heaven. Did the scriptures give any indication of what the future would hold with regard to zealous kingdom proclamation? Yes, they did. In his illustration of the wheat and weeds, Jesus foretold a period of spiritual drowsiness during which a great apostasy would flourish. The devil so counterfeit Christians among the wheat-like sons of the kingdom. Jesus foretold that this development would be permitted, but only until harvest time, at the conclusion of the system of things. Still, there must have been sincere and zealous followers of Jesus Christ on the earthly scene through the centuries. Although at times they may have been few in number, we can be confident that true to his promise, Jesus was with them all the days. But what about our day? The last days, marked by what the Apostle Paul referred to as critical times, hard to deal with. Jesus' presence has begun, and so has the conclusion of the system of things. And how happy we are that there is now a clear demarcation between the weeds, or the sons of the wicked ones, and the wheat, or the sons of the kingdom. Fulfill Bible prophecies and reliable chronology unmistakably pinpoint the autumn of 1914 as the end of the appointed times of the nations. At that time, what had been revealed to the Apostle John and what had been recorded at Revelation 11:15 came to pass. Loud voices occurred in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world did become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Something very significant was to take place on earth following that wondrous event in heaven. Worldwide kingdom proclamation had to be accomplished in a relatively short time. That was the focus of the call to action declaration sounded at the Cedar Point Convention in 1922. 
But what would move people to share zealously in this special work? What would motivate them to serve wholeheartedly out of love for Jehovah and for his righteousness? How would they become fired with zeal to go forth as people representing Jehovah, the God of truth, and to proclaim his kingdom message? What would they need? The answer, they needed spiritual enlightenment. To be motivated, they needed to take in accurate knowledge of God's word, the Bible. But people in general had been kept in spiritual darkness for centuries, ever since the great apostasy had brought forth Christendom, the most reprehensible part of Babylon the Great. For that reason, decades before the establishment of the kingdom in 1914, Jehovah began calling together his modern-day anointed servants on earth and preparing them for a special ministry. During the second half of the 19th century, Jehovah began in a marvelous way to provide spiritual enlightenment for sincere lovers of truth, his faithful anointed servants on earth. Jehovah saw to it that religious error was swept away. The Bible students learned that Jehovah is the only true God, that Jesus Christ is his only begotten Son, and that the Holy Spirit is not a person, but Jehovah's active force. So they discarded the pagan trinity doctrine. Upon learning what the Bible says about the condition of the dead, they rejected the doctrine of the immortality of the soul, along with related erroneous beliefs borrowed from pagan religions, such as the teachings of hellfire and purgatory. The Bible teaching of the ransom was brought to the fore, and it gave the Bible students a genuine hope based on Jehovah's undeserved kindness, wonderfully expressed through his son Jesus. They rejoice to learn that under God's kingdom rule, the earth will become a paradise and will remain forever as home for obedient mankind. Yes, as we have seen, it was accurate knowledge of God and of his righteous purpose that engendered profound love and fiery zeal in the heart of Jesus. This was also the case with Jesus' disciples in the first century, and it is the same today. When the time approached for the kingdom good news to be proclaimed, Jesus caused truth to shine forth. As recorded in Matthew 13, 43, Jesus foretold, At that time, the righteous ones will shine as brightly as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. On the basis of revealed Bible truth, Jehovah called out his true worshipers and equipped them to give a final witness to the nations before he pours out his righteous indignation on all practices of what is bad. In 1922, at the Cedar Point Convention, Jehovah began to shed greater light on the scriptures and to reveal the outworking of his purpose through the newly established kingdom. It was time for the faithful remnant of anointed Christians who had been entrusted with the marvelous kingdom truth to declare it abroad to all the nations. We who are present at this zealous kingdom proclaimers district convention must praise Jehovah for opening the way for a worldwide proclamation of the good news and for allowing time for it to reach down to us. Aren't we grateful to be beneficiaries of the forward movement of Jehovah's organization down to this very day? <laughs> Certainly, it is by Jehovah's undeserved kindness and by the fiery zeal of a spiritual generation of kingdom proclaimers that we have the privilege of being counted among the six million kingdom proclaimers today. That being so, it is fitting that each one of us make a self-examination. Through your study of God's word, do you recognize that Jehovah is the rightful sovereign of the universe and that the time will soon come for his sovereignty to be vindicated and for his name to be sanctified and exalted for all eternity? Are you diligently cultivating a close relationship with Jehovah and carefully directing your steps so as to be pleasing to him? Are you a lover of righteousness and a hater of what is bad? 
Does your love for neighbor move you to speak forth the good news of kingdom truth so that deserving ones may benefit? Yes, as the speaker asked so many years ago at that Cedar Point Convention, we need to ask, do you believe that the King of Glory has begun his reign? If so, then we say, advertise, advertise, advertise the King and his kingdom. Be determined to make known to everyone your affirmative response. But in this troubled and dangerous world, how can you press on courageously advertising the king and his kingdom? You, indeed all of God's devoted servants, can do so by imitating the zeal demonstrated by Jehovah, his son, and by the faithful remnant of anointed ones. May all of us be steadfast in integrity and move forward as kingdom proclaimers fired with zeal. Thank you very much, Brother Jones, for helping us to appreciate examples of godly zeal which we do well to imitate. We've received some 